Okay, tell me everything you can remember about ionic bonds. Oh, wow. Panak, go. Metals and non-metals. You should have it already. Perfect. They don't, they don't collect, uh, conduct electricity in solid state, but they do in a molten or liquid state. Good. Molten just means that it's going to be a liquid state. And how else? They conduct in solid, molten, liquid, and? Uh, I forget. I was going to say something wrong. Aqueous. Okay. Aqueous means? Oh, I thought that meant liquid. Because I had that written down. Okay, so let's clarify what the difference is. This is why I'm doing this. Clarify the difference between liquid and aqueous. Liquid means I've taken a pure substance. That means I only have one thing, and I've heated it up until it's become a liquid. Aqueous means I have taken something, I have added it to water, and it dissolved in the water, and because it dissolved in the water, now it is mixed with the water. Okay. That's the difference. So solid, liquid, and gas are going to be pure substances. Aqueous is going to be a mixture. That is a popular test question. They'll say, which of the following is a mixture? And you're looking for the aqueous. Go. You had your hand up. Um, um, they're, in like, they're called salts. They are called salts. I love it. Uh, the electron is not shared equally among the two. Give me more. The electron is not shared equally. It's that's with a T. Transferred. Transferred. And it's not equally because one of them is so much stronger than the other. So if you have something like um, sodium chloride. The chlorine is so much stronger than the sodium that the chlorine basically pulls the electron away. It says AQ. AQ stands for aqueous. <coughs> and aqueous means mixed with water. So you can take, hold on one second, Kevin, you're next. Um, you can take a substance, an ionic substance, and you can mix it with water, and then that ionic substance <coughs> will dissolve and will be able to conduct electricity. Let me draw a picture of that after Kevin tells me what he wants to tell me. Oh, I was going to miss the point. High melting million points. High melting <coughs> MP melting point and high boiling point. Okay. So let me just get another piece of paper here, and let's draw an ionic crystal. Look at that, plus minus. Copy. Now, these are really called particle diagrams. Remember back in the beginning of time, I told you I'm skipping unit one? This is unit one. Okay? So it's a particle diagram, and a particle diagram is basically just saying, I'm going to take these funky circles, and I'm going to illustrate what atoms look like. I'm going to illustrate what um, compounds look like, just using these circles. So this right here, positive and negative, that's an ionic compound. It's an ionic compound because it's between a positive and a negative. A positive ion and a negative ion. Now, when you have multiple of these, they are going to form a crystal lattice structure. Copy this sucker. Paste this sucker. Didn't we talk about this the other day when Mr. Uh, yes. Dr. Skaggs walked in? No, he didn't. That wasn't your class. Um, but we did look at something like this. Yes. And this is a solid crystal. It's solid because all of these particles are packed up nice and close and tight to each other. So I want you to write this down because we did not write this down and I know that this is um, unit one.
So let's do it. These are supposed to be squares. Obviously, they're not, but they're close enough. Okay. A solid is going to, ooh, a solid is going to be illustrated with the little s. Okay. If you have a solid, all of the little particles are going to be nice, up close, tight, and packed nice and symmetric. Okay. This is called a regular geometric pattern. If, if they ask you which of the following is a regular geometric pattern, you're looking for a solid. That's as simple as it gets. So give me an element on the periodic table that would give you a regular geometric pattern. Cobalt. Cobalt. Mm -hmm. Sodium. Copper. Copper. Mm -hmm. Magnesium. Anything that we didn't color that was a solid. Okay? The L that's next is going to be a liquid. I'm going to draw them in blue because I can. Okay? Not for any other reason, but I can. Do you see how there's a little bit less order in the liquid? You see how the particles are on the lower half of that box? And these particles are actually able to slide past one another? This is a liquid. This guy was a solid. All right, and then let's do gas. I'll do gas in red, like red hot gas. Woo. Okay, so gases are going to be a G. With a solid, they are going to have a definite shape they're going to have a definite volume. If I hand you a block, it's a block. If I hand you a, a ball, it's a ball. If I hand you a desk, it's a desk. Definite shape, definite volume. Liquids are going to have no definite shape but they are going to have a definite volume no pattern right no pattern with liquids or gases so what i mean by no definite shape is let's say kevin is really thirsty he wants some orange juice and he pours it into his glass that's shaped like a mickey mouse head what is the shape of Kevin's orange juice going to be? Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse head. Liquids have no definite shape. You want a swimming pool that's in the shape of a, I don't know, a kidney? Then you get a kidney-shaped swimming pool. You want a heart bathtub? You get a heart bathtub. It doesn't matter what the container is. That liquid is going to take the shape of that container. But the volume of the liquid that you put in there doesn't change. If I have a swimming pool in the shape of a kidney, right, and I pour one glass of water in it, it's not going to fill the entire swimming pool. Okay? It has a definite volume. The liquid has a definite volume. Now, gases, on the other hand, have no definite shape. No definite shape. And they have no definite volume. What do I mean by that? All right, so let's talk about shape. Um, Olivia goes to Dollar Tree. She wants a star-shaped helium balloon. They hand her the helium. It's the shape of the star. It has no shape. She goes home. She takes the helium out of that balloon, and she throws it into a balloon the shape of a... A turtle. A turtle. So that helium will take the shape of whatever strikes her fancy at that moment. Because helium is a gas, 
It has no definite shape. I can make it any shape I want. Is this in the liquid though? Well, liquid, yes. Liquid will also take the shape of the container. It has no definite shape. But here's the difference. The gases have no definite volume. So if I have a balloon that is the shape of a turtle and I let that gas go in that turtle, that gas is going to fill the entire balloon. Or if I have a balloon that's just the size of a little, I don't know, a hippopotamus, okay, then it's just going to fill the shape of the hippopotamus. It doesn't, it's, the volume is not definite. I can change the volume of the gas. One second. For instance, if I had smelly stuff, you know, that can of smelly stuff, or a perfume, or a cologne, or whatever, and I sprayed it over here, so it's aerosolized, it's in the air, it's a vapor, eventually, Kevin and Rob are going to smell it, because I, I sprayed it over here, and then it's going to make its way back to Mira, slowly going back, it's going to fill the volume of the container, which is going to be the room. So it has no definite volume. It's going to keep expanding until it fills the entire volume of the room. You understand? Yeah. Also, let's talk about uh, pressure of a gas for a few minutes. This exerts no pressure because those atoms are in, they're locked in place. The liquid gives it a little pressure, but gases exert pressure on the inside of their container because they are constantly bouncing around and hitting the walls of their container. The more they hit the walls of the container, the higher the pressure is going to be. How can we get those things, boys, how can we get those things to hit the container more frequently? What are some things we can do? Heat it up. Heat it up. We heat it up, the gas starts moving faster, they hit the inside walls of the container faster, and therefore they are going to increase the pressure. So you're driving down the road in your automobile, right? And the tires are going, they're heating up. What's going to happen to the pressure inside that tire? It's going to increase. If you have your tire in the driveway, and it's February, and it's really cold outside, What's going to happen to the pressure of the gas that's in the tire? It's going to decrease. So sometimes when it's really cold, that little exclamation point on your dashboard, that, that's on the dashboard of your car, goes off. That means low tire pressure. It's not a real exclamation point. It's right next to the gravy boat. You know what the gravy boat is? <laughs> yeah, the oil. Very good. It, it looks like a gravy boat. It kind of looks like that, and then it has, a, I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Kind of looks. I don't know what that, that is. Looks like a sled. <laughs> that, that looks like a sled. Like if you were. <laughs> yeah, the thing that Aladdin comes out of. But you get the idea. Ooh. But it was Aladdin's lamp. Oh, well, he stole it from the lion. <laughs> <laughs> I just hit my knee on the. <laughs> on the drawer. Okay. I don't know. Don't. I can't. I can't. Um. It is not happening. Okay. What? I can't hear you because they're being loud. Flat. It is a state of matter. Um, it's at high temperatures. We're not talking about that state of matter. Okay? All right. There's one more that we do need to talk about, though, and that is not a pure substance. Okay? These are all pure substances. And what I mean by pure substance is that if I reach into the box, any one of these boxes, let's say I reached in here, I'm getting a purple... Um, a purple circle. Actually, if I reach in, I'm going to get 16 purple circles because they're all attached to each other. It's like a block. If I reach in here, I'm getting a blue circle. If I reach in here, I'm getting a red circle. These are pure substances. 
Is this a pure substance? Yes, and I reach into that box, I'm getting a red circle, okay? But if I do this, now it's not a pure substance anymore. It's representing two different particles. So let's say this thing right here is, I don't know, uh, carbon, and this is um, magnesium, okay? It could be a, oh, who smelled, who sprayed the stinky stuff? I smell it. How long did it take to get to me? <laughs> Is that you guys sprayed it? No. Vanilla? <laughs> well, that's that's some vanilla spelling fart then. <laughs> the speed of smell. So <laughs> this. Where you guess where you guess the lamp? You guess the lamp from, and then he also gets the flying carpet from it. Yes, we're still talking about it. Okay, oh this is a mixture. You need to pay attention now. I know it's the end of the day, but focus, okay? So this is a mixture, okay? It's a mixture of two different substances. And I know that because if I reached into this box right now, I would either get a red one or a green one. I don't know which one I'm going to get. Most likely because you got more red than green there. Okay. H2O. Get used to seeing that. Okay. I am going to draw it about 8 million times between now and June. Water has the formula H2O. It's got a little 2 here. Do you know what that's called? A subscript. And a subscript tells us how many of that particular atom are in the compound? Define compound. Two, two, two different elements combined. Two different elements, good. That are attached to each other. They are chemically combined. Okay, so if I draw water, it's going to look like this. Okay? Or, if I draw it in particles, it would look like that. Okay? Same thing. So let's throw some water into this box. Stop talking. Here's a water. There's a water. Everywhere's a water, water. Okay, so there's three waters in there. Okay? Is that a pure substance? <coughs> Yes, because if I reach into the box, what am I going to get? Water. I'm going to get water, no matter what. So I could write this as if I can even pull them down a little bit so that it looks like they're liquid. Okay? And I could even put another one in here just for fun. Okay? This is liquid water. So I would write H2O with an L after it. What happens if I drop something into that water, like salt, and I'm going to illustrate the salt with these little dots. Is that a pure substance anymore? No. no, it is a mixture. So if this is the salt, and I'm going to use the salt sodium chloride, and it is mixed with water, I'm going to illustrate that with a little AQ after it. So this is the substance, and the AQ means mixed with water. It stands for aqueous. Is aqueous a pure substance? No, no. no sorry, Bob. It is not a pure substance. It is a mixture. And they love to ask this question. They'll say, which of the following is a mixture? And they'll do something like this. N-A-C-L. And they'll do L-S-G-A-Q. Which one's the mixture? That one. That means mixed with water. Gabich? Yes. Gabich. Okay. How do we feel about ionic substances? Good? What? It's mixed with water. So if you see the AQ, it means it's mixed with water. That's what it means. Let's take 
let's take one more step down our chemistry journey and let's talk about the actual water molecule. I'm going to draw it like this. Okay? You don't know enough yet, but I'm going to tell you. So you're going to have to take my word for it for about another week and a half. Water is a little magnet. One side of the water molecule is positively charged, and the other side of the water molecule is negatively charged. You will understand why that is by the end of this unit, but right now just take my word for it. And if you don't want to take my word for it, think back to a day where you're in a car and you see little beads of water on the windshield, and they get closer and closer and closer to each other, and all of a sudden they go whoop, really fast. It's because they get close enough that the positive end of the water attracts itself to the negative end of the other water molecule that is around it. Okay, that's exactly what's happening. So this water molecule is sticky. It sticks to another water molecule. Remember that sodium chloride, woo, that's not a pen. Sodium chloride, sodium has, a, has one electron. Chlorine had seven electrons. Did I draw this for you yet? <coughs> and it's an ionic bond. An ionic bond means there is a transfer of the electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. This is the metal. It is much weaker than this guy. This guy has a strength. What do we call the strength? The electronegativity. The stuff that we did in the previous units are going to come back to haunt you. Okay, electronegativity is how strong an atom is. So this sodium is only a 0.9. This chlorine is a 2 point, I lied, 3.2. Look them up. Make sure you understand where I'm getting those numbers from. They're on table S. If they fight, who's winning? Yeah. So this electron that's right here, don't write anything. Look, this electron goes here. Okay? I'm going to illustrate that with a line that shows the movement of the electron from this metal to the nonmetal. Now the sodium is positively charged. I put it in little brackets because I'm showing that it's a Lewis dot diagram of that sodium. Then I'm going to take the chlorine and show that it gained an electron. See that electron that came from the sodium? And it becomes a negative one charge. This right here, attractive force between the positive sodium and the negative chlorine is what we call an ionic bond. It's an ionic bond because it's between two ions. One's positive and one's negative. Now you can draw that. This is an ionic bond right here. And yes, you have to draw the whole thing when you're drawing an ionic bond. You figure out if it's an ionic bond, by looking, is it a metal and a nonmetal? Is the electronegativity difference greater than 1.7? Yes, it is. If that's the case, the ions, the, I'm sorry, the electrons are transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. I might have to move the two of you. Okay. And this little thing right here, there's an attractive force. See, I'm putting a little heart because they love each other now. Okay? They are in love. The positive and the negative are attracted to one another. That's the ionic bond. So we're going to be drawing a lot of these ionic bonds. When you draw an ionic bond, you always have brackets. All right, let's get back to the water. Does the water have any brackets in here? No, it's not an ionic bond. It's a covalent bond. We didn't talk about them yet. 
So take my word for it. This is what it looks like. It's like a little magnet. Okay. The ionic bond is over here. Okay. So here's the sodium with its positive charge. Here's the chlorine with its negative charge. And now I'm going to introduce water, which is a magnet. What do you think is going to happen when the water and the sodium chloride come in contact with one another? They don't really react. It's a physical change. It's a physical change. Well, look, if this is a magnet, what do you think this chlorine is going to be attracted to? Which side of the magnet? The positive side. And where is this sodium going to go? to the negative side, okay? This right here is called dissolving, right? When we dissolve salt, the water splits the ions into two pieces. It's not a chemical change. It's a physical change because the sodium and the chlorine, all I have to do is take this water out, and all of a sudden, if I take this water out by dehydrating it, these guys go right back together, and they become sodium chloride again. Okay? We're going to draw a, b a bunch of these okay. in the next couple of days. If you want to jot it down now, that's fine. This is dissolving. Whoops, I have it on the wrong side. This is dissolving. In chemistry, we call that dissociation. We're dissociating the ions from each other. And I'm going to write it the way we would normally write it. NaCl plus water. Those are my reactants becomes sodium ion aqueous and chlorine ion aqueous. Okay? Now the sodium chloride and the water, the sodium ion and the chlorine ion are dissolved in the water. They are mixed with the water. That's how we dissolve salts. We're getting to real chemistry now. Yeah. Finally, some real stuff. Got it? Yep. This is all an anti We're talking about the covalent bonds. And it's not an puzzle. I put an Ed puzzle up today. Did you do one today? <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. It's fine. Then you, then they're doing it either later today or tomorrow. So okay. I put it up there, but yeah, this is this is exactly what the Ed puzzle's on. I'm also doing I owe you. Okay. Any questions on ionic? How do you know you have an ionic compound? There's a metal and a non-metal. And, non and then if there's a metal and a non-metal, it's going to do this. How much time do I have left? Okay. Let's draw, let's draw another ionic compound, because I can use up my five minutes with drawing another ionic compound. Let's do lithium and fluorine, those two atoms. Is it going to form an ionic compound? Because that's really, the, when you are doing any of this stuff, the first question you should ask yourself, is it forming an ionic bond or a covalent bond? Well, we didn't do covalent yet. So is this going to form an ionic bond? Yes. yes. All right. And I know that because I got a metal and I got a non-metal. So lithium has how many valence electrons? Uno. Fluorine has how many? Seven. seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know what? I'm not following my own rules. Twelve o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, twelve o'clock, three o'clock, <coughs> six o'clock. All right. Show the transfer of electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. You're going to do that with this fancy line. You could draw it a straight line if you want. Okay? I like drawing a fancy line. That's step one. Step two, we're going to draw lithium, who is now naked, with a plus one charge in brackets. Get him some clothes. Fluorine has seven of its own electrons, and he gained an electron from the lithium. He has a negative one charge. 
okay? This right here, the attractive force between the lithium positive ion, the cation, cation, and the anion is the ionic bond. Right there is the ionic bond. Easy peasy? Yep. Last thing I'm going to tell you. When you look at the charges of these things, what is the sum of the charges? Zero. zero. It will always be zero. And you can only use one type of cation and one type of anion. And that's the road we're leading down tomorrow because I'm going to now start giving you things with plus twos and plus threes. Okay? All right. I'm done. Actual chemistry. Real, real stuff today. Yeah.